Knots in my yo-yo string. Writing about his childhood in Norristown, Pennsylvania, author Jerry Spinelli remembers Hawes Avenue, his dentist, and all the neighbors, bullies, girlfriends, Zepp sandwiches, and pesky yo-yo string knots that filled his days between Hartranft Elementary and Norristown High, and that later filled his books. On Friday evening, October 11, 1957, at Roosevelt Field, site of my 50-yard dash triumph five years before, Norristown High School played Lower Marion in a football game under the lights. Lower Marion was a powerhouse. Over the preceding three years they had won 32 games in a row. But Norristown was good, too. It figured to be a close, fiercely contested game, and it was. I was a junior now, 16 years old, and my autumn sport had become soccer, but I still loved football. I was one of thousands in the grandstand. As the teams changed field direction for the start of the fourth quarter, Norristown was leading, 7-6. Each team had scored a touchdown, but the aces of Lower Marion had missed the extra point. But now a Lower Marion halfback was breaking free and racing downfield, blue and white shirt Norristown Eagles in pursuit. The Eagles stopped him on the one-yard line, and the stage was set for one of the great moments in Norristown's scholastic sports history. First down go on the one. One little yard. 36 little inches. Lower Marion. 32 straight victories. Who could stop them? In the bleachers across the field the Lower Marion fans celebrated. Norristown fans grimly awaited the inevitable. The first ace ball carrier plunged ahead helmet first, the lower Marion side erupted in a touchdown roar, but, strangely, no touchdown sign came from the referee. The ball carrier was crumpled in the rude arms of Eagle defender Mike Branca. The ball had advanced nary an inch. Twice more the aces ran the ball, attacking different points in the Eagle defense. The results were the same. The center Marion side was rising and falling as if directed by a choir master. But now, as the ace quarterback bent over the center for the fourth time and barked out the count, Roosevelt Field fell silent. For the fourth time, the ace quarterback handed the ball to a running back, they refused to believe anyone could stop them from ramrodding the ball 36 little inches, and for the fourth time the ball failed to penetrate the end zone. The impossible had been done. Now it was the Norris downside that erupted, with a roar and a celebration that continued through the end of the game and burst from the stadium and spread out across the town and late into the night. I rode the tide. Lower Marion. We had beaten Lower Marion. I couldn't believe it. At home in my room I could hear the blaring horns, the shrieks of victory. Again, and again, following my old habit, I replayed the miraculous Eagle goal line defense in my head. I went to sleep re-experiencing the event, re-feeling the thrill. In the morning I woke up and daydreamed on and began to realize that I had a problem. No matter how, many times I replayed the goal line stand in my head, I kept falling short of satisfaction. The scoreboard had said the game was over, but for me it wasn't, for me it was somehow frustratingly incomplete. I discovered that Roosevelt Field was not the only field that the game had been played on, the other was inside myself. The game kept happening and happening within me. I could not come to the end of it. And then for no reason that I can recall, I sat down at my study desk and reached for a pencil and paper and wrote down a title. Then I began to write rhyming verse. And the verses became a poem. Goal to go. The score stood seven to six. With but five minutes to go. The ace attack.
all tricks to settle down its stubborn foe. It looked as though the game was done when an ace stepped wide, round right. An eagle stopped him on the one and tumult filled the night. Thirty-two had come their way and thirty-two had died. Would number thirty-three this day for one yard be denied? Roy Kent, the eagle mentor, said, I've waited for this game, and now, defense, go, stop, am dead. And crash the Hall of Fame. The first ace bolted for the goal. And nothing did he see. But Branca, swearing on his soul. You shall not pass by me. The next two plays convinced all. The ref would make the touchdown sign. But when the light shone on the ball. It still lay inches from the line. Said Captain Eastwood to his jets. It s up to us to stop this drive. Said Duckworth, Avery, Nair, and Spence. We'll do, as long as we're alive. The halfback drove with all his might. His legs were jet propelled. But when the dust had cleared the fight, the eagle line had held. On a September day in 1992, 35 years after Norristown High's historic goal line stand, I stood before an audience of children and adults in Fargo, North Dakota. I was there in connection with my novel Maniac McGee, which had recently won the Newbery Medal for Children's Literature. The important award on this day, however, was the Flicker Tale, which had been voted to Maniac McGee as a favorite of North Dakota's young readers. A hundred elementary school kids sat cross-legged on the floor as I accepted the plaque. After giving a little talk, I invited the audience to ask questions. There were many. One of them stays with me still. It came from a boy who said, do you think being a kid helped you to become a writer? Good question. After writing Goal to Go, I gave it to my father and forgot about it. Several days later I opened the Times Herald to the sports section, and there was my poem, printed in a box with the headline, Student Waxes Poetic. At school the next day everyone, kids, teachers, football coaches, told me how much they liked it. That, I believe, was the beginning. By the time I went off to Gettysburg College two years later, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I graduated from Gettysburg, attended the writing seminars at the Johns Hopkins University, spent six months on active duty with the Naval Air Reserve, got a job as a menswear editor for a department store magazine, and in my spare time began to write my first novel. Three years later I finished it, but no one wanted to publish it. So I wrote another and another and another. Wrote them on my lunch hours, after work, weekends. For novels over 13 years. Nobody wanted them. In the meantime I gained a wife, Eileen, also a writer, and six kids. One day for dinner we had chicken. There were leftovers. I packed the unclaimed pieces into a paper bag and put it in the refrigerator, intending to take it to work for lunch the following day. But when I opened the bag early the next morning, 
I found only chicken bones. The meat had been eaten away. No doubt this was the work of one of the six little angels sleeping upstairs. Knowing no one would confess, I'm still waiting, I went to work that day lunchless and began to imagine how it might have gone had I known who the culprit was and confronted him or her in the kitchen. By noon I had decided to write down my imaginings. I was about to do so, intending to describe the scene from the point of view of the chicken-deprived father, when it suddenly occurred to me that there was a more interesting point of view here, namely, the kids. And so with ballpoint pen and yellow copy paper in a tiny windowless office on the fifth floor of the Chilton Company in Radnor, Pennsylvania, I wrote these words. One by one my stepfather took the chicken bones out of the bag and laid them on the kitchen table. He laid them down real neat. In a row. Five of them. Two leg bones, two wing bones, one thigh bone. And bones is all they were. There wasn't a speck of meat on them. Was this really happening? Did my stepfather really drag me out of bed at 7 o'clock in the morning on my summer vacation so I could stand in the kitchen in my underpants and stare down at a row of chicken bones? That night at home I kept writing. I gave the chicken snatcher a name, Jason, and an age, 12. And I started remembering. Remembering when I was 12, when I lived in the West End, when I went to Stewart Junior High School, when I wanted to be a shortstop, when I rode a bike, when I marveled at the nighttime sky. In my head I replayed moments from my kidhood. I mixed my memories with imagination to make stories, to make fiction, and when I finished writing, I had a book, my fifth novel, my first about kids. I called it Space Station 7th Grade. It became my first published book. In the years that followed, I continued to write stories about kids and to rummage through the attic of my memories. Norristown became two mills in my fiction, George Street became Oriole. There is a prom in one book and a girlfriend named Judy in another. There is a beautiful blonde who lives on an avenue called Hawes and a mysterious man on whose front steps no kid dares sit. There is a zep and a mulberry tree, a little league field, a park, a zoo, a band shell, a red hill, and a mother who whistles her kids home to dinner. There is a called Schoolkill and a creek called Stony and a grocery store on a corner next to a house whose address is 802. And a brown finger in a white mouth. And a boy who is a wizard at untying knots in yo-yo strings. Do you think being a kid helped you to become a writer? I could have taken days to answer the boy's question, but neither he nor Fargo had that much time. So I simply nodded and smiled and said, yes, I believe it did. 